We want to deal with this uh, concept of the kenosis of Christ. The word is written up here. It's a Greek word. And we'll get into exactly what it means here in just a moment. But um, in Philippians 2, um, let's start with verse 5. And if you really, well, you know what? Um, We're going to start with verse 1 there of chapter 2, but let me say this. Paul is not writing this as a theological reality. He's not. He's not, he's not thinking theologically. He's writing the things that we're going to be studying this, in this class strictly and simply because there are problems in the churches, and particularly what he's writing here, uh, problems between members of the body of Christ within this church in Philippians. And Paul's um, method or his way of dealing with things is not Christian counseling. It's not... Um, delving into the scriptures and straightening people out and trying to get them to become more scriptural. It is very simply that he shows what Christ is and who we are in union with Christ. Now consider, I mean, just consider that for a moment. What, that's an incredible method. It probably should be used by more Christian leaders. Pointing to Christ. I mean, wouldn't you think that would be a, a good, good way? And again, so let me, say, let me say that because we get our hands in the middle of the problem. We try to figure out the problem instead of point to the answer. And the answer is Christ. Paul figures, Paul figures everything on this basis. Jesus came and is the fulfillment of all of it, and we are one with him. His life, his nature, will take care of everything that God ever wanted. In other words, it can fulfill every commandment. Notice I didn't say keep, because the commandment still falls short. Because Christ is what God had in mind, and it was making us one with him that was the great picture of that. Uh, you've heard me say, you know, uh, in the past teaching, I would say, you know, here's God sitting on the throne of glory up there, and, and he, he, he looks at angels, and they have fallen. And they, you know, some of them have left their first estate and they have, they have gone the way of sin and corruption. And then he creates man and man falls and he goes the way of sin and corruption. And imagine God sitting there and going, gosh, I wish I just had somebody. I wish I could just come up with somebody that wouldn't fail me. And then he turns and he looks at Jesus and goes, you know, you've never failed me, not even once. I've got a plan. I'll send you and I'll make them one with you so that all that is true in you will flow into them as branches. Now, of course, it didn't happen like that. God knew from the very foundation of the world Christ was the answer and would be the answer. And the vine wasn't an afterthought where he goes, hmm, I think I'll copy that. Ridiculous. All things were made by him and for him and to him, and by him all things consist. Or the original Greek there in Colossians is, by him all things are held together. And without Christ, everything falls apart. Just a fact. Without, and when I say without Christ, I don't mean without Christian. I don't, I'm not talking about without the Christian religion. Churches fall apart, and they're part of the Christian religion. People fall apart, and they're part of the Christian religion. Christ doesn't, and he is the one that God blessed us with by making us one. 
and, and I would say it is not a blessing to just send Jesus and make us friends with Jesus. Because then all I ever see is the contrast of how good he is and how bad I am. Does that make sense to anybody? If he's there and I'm here, if there's two of us, then all I do is look at him and go, oh, me, you know. And then he looks at me and goes, oh, him, you know. Because it's, it's bad. It's bad. And the only hope for, folks, the only hope for fallen mankind is Christ. The only hope for the church is to get off of the religious kick and find Christ as life and to find union with Christ so that what he is manifests in his body, which we are. So that's the, that's the basis that Paul is about to present this information. Again, consider that we go to Philippians and we look there for the theological truths. And Paul is not speaking theologically, he's speaking practically. He's got one thing on his mind. There's problems in this church and I'm going to give you the answer. Okay? So you ready to sort of follow along that line? Now, this is a man who's already been dealing with stuff in chapter 1. He's already been be de dealing with this church in chapter 1. And now he says in, in chapter 2, verse 1, If there be therefore any consolation or comfort of Christ, in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any tender mercies and compassion, listen to this. He's saying, look, if there's any... He keeps using that word any. Is there any of these things? Is there any consolations in Christ? Is there any comfort of love? Is there any fellowship of the Spirit? If there are any tender mercies in this body, any compassions, fulfill ye my joy that you be like-minded. But he's about to express something. He's about to take you from... Uh, from where the problem lies within them to this, uh, these facts, and then he's going to form these facts to be Christ. What, what a blessing to have a man that would do that, and that's what he's doing here. Because he says, if there's any of this, be of the same mind, be like-minded, um, and have the same love being of one accord and of one mind. All right. So at this point, he's pointing out that there are problems between people. Can you believe it? And now he's saying there shouldn't be. We should be of the same mind. And, and here's what he's addressing. At first, he's sort of giving you a religious picture, and then he's going to form it in, Christ, in the, as a picture of Christ. Consolation, comfort of love, fellowship of the Spirit, any tender, tender mercies, any compassions. Then if there's any of that, then fulfill my joy in that you would be like-minded, having the same love, being one of, of one accord, of one mind. There is the picture. He didn't say... Can't we all just get along? He's describing how Christ will appear in his body. That's what he's talking about. Now, he hasn't revealed that yet with these words. He's preparing them because, because many of these people in Philippians and Corinthians and whatever, they were not Jews before. Many of them don't know anything about that, but they know about religion. And every religion, every religion other than maybe Satan worship, teaches patience and love and getting along. You know what I mean? They all teach that. So he's got their attention. And then he says in verse 3, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. Let nothing let nothing, how many of you uh, are operating in the Lord in such a manner that you let nothing be done through strife or vainglory? 
Well, then what is the lack? Well, Father, forgive me because I still have times where I allow strife. I do things by strife, or I, I'm seeking glory that is vain, vain glory. No, it's not what he's, that's not where he's trying to bring you. And you may go there, even with him speaking the word of God, you may go there, but he's not talking to you about that. Now, he's not talking about beat yourself. He's not talking about even look at yourself. He's talking about look at yourself and then consider where the true lack is. And the true lack isn't that you do let things be done by vain glory, trying to seek glory for yourself or, or out of strife because you're jealous or you, you've got pride and somebody wounded your pride. You know, ultimately, this is about Christ. As long as we make it a sin issue, we'll never fix it. Um, or we'll, we'll repair slowly. We'll take our time. But when it becomes a thing of Christ and, you know, a thing of Christ and a heart for Christ... One plus one equal, you know, when it's a thing about Christ and you have a heart for Christ, then you go, I cannot stand to manifest, to, to claim to be a member of his body and manifest anything that is short of Christ. Now, that doesn't mean you'll be perfect tomorrow. We're not talking about perfection. We're not talking about shaping up. We're talking about keeping your heart after the Lord so that even if you can't fix it, you are at least brokenhearted because it's not Christ. I, I believe that's the best way. I believe it's the best way because it, it really is focused on him, not you and your failures. Not you and your failures. And this is where you rise or fall. You either rise in the resurrection by oneness or you fall in the pit of your own vomit because you look at yourself too long you know does that make sense yeah. any questions any thoughts yes right well we the whole thing is is that we're self-centered again or have remained self-centered. We were self-centered in our vain glory. You know, we were self-centered in our, um, uh, what was the word, uh, strife, because we're striving out of pride. And now we're self-centered because we're focused on our self-failures, our, you know, we're, we're wallowing in self-pity. It's all self. But we go, no, no, I've come, I've made major progress. I used to be over here and was full of strife over my pride and was full of vain glory trying to be something. But now I'm over here and look how broken I am. You know, but that brokenness is nothing more than self-pity. It's still focused, turned around and looking at self. Oh, look at me. And, and of course, if God doesn't come and do something quick, how do you get out of self-pity? You step back over into pride. You know? How do you get out of poor self-image? Step into superiority. You know? But God cares nothing for any of that. He cares nothing for it. He sent his son to be the answer. And if he's not, if he's not to the glory of God. Um, I was thinking today, just meditating on that scripture in uh, 2 Corinthians uh, 3, where it says, Beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. And I remember looking it up one time, and the word beholding was surprising because it really wasn't like us standing here and we're looking at the word and we're 
beholding the Lord, and then we're changed by looking in, in that sense. The word beholding was actually reflecting. So that it's almost like we're the mirror. And he's looking into us, and we are reflecting back his glory to, to the world and to him and to the Father. And, uh, yes. Jim Armstrong always used to say when he preached on it a lot that, that, that there was a dual meaning there, that it was both, that it was beholding and reflecting at once. Right. That there was a... Well, and I think there is, because there is that, change that starts taking place and let's face it a mirror isn't changed into the image it reflects but we are so there is that there is that dual meaning <clears throat> uh, which just saved uh, 40 years of teaching because I've always taught it the other way <clears throat> okay uh, and then the next verse here is um, not next verse, but the middle of verse 3. Don't let it be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Now, how many really do that? I mean, how many really look and esteem them? It doesn't mean that they're better. It doesn't mean that they're better than you. But it means that you honor them. You know? I mean... He wasn't even a Christian, but this is one of the things that, that people were impressed with Gandhi over. Because he, he, got, he was a, an attorney and a big shot and everything, and he saw how the regular lackeys were being treated in India, and he got down literally lower than they did, and then stood up for him. You know. Well, you know, I don't want to be Gandhi-like. I want to be Christ-like. In fact, I don't even want to be Christ-like. I want it to be Christ formed in me. And so, and Paul does too, and that's why he's finishing off this, this uh, thought. But he's, before, listen, before he can tell you it needs to be Christ in you, he has to describe to you what that is. Do you, do you get it? Um, we say, so somebody says, okay, I want it to be Christ in me. And um, so, you know, Jesus, before he came, for all eternity before he came to the earth, was, sat on a throne and was rich and had everything he ever wanted. And I want to be Christ-like. Do, do you understand? I mean, that, you know, they, they go that route. And others say, well, he's a mighty warrior, and he trampled, you know, I, mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Sounds like a great song, but, you know, I mean, he's trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are still. I mean, he, he is marching through and wiping everyone out, okay? Glory, glory, hallelujah. And we're all going, yeah, you know, I don't think we understand. He's coming for you. <laughs> <laughs> But so we picture that, and we say, that's it. So Paul has to be specific, or they're going to go off on some tangent, or they're going to pick what is most amiable to their mind, to their sensitivities. So he is describing this first in terms of this is what it should be, and then he's going to describe how you get it, by oneness with Christ. Okay, so he's saying... Um, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. All right. Now, he's given us a really good picture of, up to this point, how we should act. And specifically, how we should treat one another. There's no mention here. You know, like Paul saying, oh, by the way, this is only one aspect of the Lord. It's just the lamb aspect. No mention of the lamb. This is just Jesus. This is just the mind of Christ. That's what he's going to say. He's not going to get into a semantics of, uh, you know. I mean, I, it's not that I'm anti-semantic. But uh, 
He's not going to get into that. He's going to, he's going to point to just what he calls Christ and the mind of Christ, period. He doesn't have to uh, take a side here, a, an aspect of Christ. To him, this is what the church needs. This is how the church functions. It's the only way the church will get along. It's the only way you'll defeat your pride, your strife, your divisions, your jealousies. It's the only way. And Paul knows that. See, he, he's the apostle to the Gentiles. He's the one sent with a message to the Gentiles, and he's given them the answer faithfully. Thank God. Thank God. So he's, he's described this in terms of, you know, being of the same mind, of tender mercies and compassion and being of one accord and one mind and, you know, don't just look on your own things. Don't just consider your own stuff. Um, esteem others better. I mean, it's one thing not to look on your own things, but to look on the things of others. I give, I give myself 80% and I look on their things 20%. But to esteem others better than yourself is to take the lower seed in the right spirit. God forbid that anybody would take the lower seat, period, unless they had the right spirit. And God forbid that anybody would think that me or anybody around here would expect them to do that except by the right spirit, especially if, especially if there had been a long time of expressing that it whatever pleases God will only come by Christ and that's been said clearly over and over and over then there can be no expectation except that which comes by Christ and to do it or to try to please brother Randy or anybody else is ridiculous because I want you to only please the father by Christ and I think Paul did that too. I think he only cared that Christ be formed in people because that in itself was enough. All right, so now he's going to get into that. He's talked, of, he's talked much about this mind being of one accord, one mind, uh, in lowliness of mind. Um, and then he starts in verse 5. And now he's going to draw us the picture of how this can be accomplished. Not that these things, compassion, uh, uh, consolations, comfort of love, not that any of these things are entities in themselves. He's, he's about to step out of the arena of, of describing uh, compassion and comfort of love and fellowship of the spirit and one mind and all of this as many separate things that you need to work on for your life. He's about to step out of that arena and say, there is no way you're going to get this on your own by going after this particular one. Now, anybody has anybody ever done that where uh, you had a season where you were trying to be more patient. So you're praying and you're seeking God for patience. And then you need to be more loving. And then you did it. Da. And if anybody's been around any length of time, what you found is eventually you come back all the way around to that patience again. And you're needing just as much as you did before. And you say, oh, I thought I had that down. Okay. That's because we are not after entities. We are not after uh, attributes. We are not divided. See, it's almost, and you know, I've used this example before. It's like, uh, you know, this cross representing Jesus. And it's, you know, and you, uh, how, how do you do this, you know? You, and so here he is, and we're going to know Jesus, so we start dissecting. You know, oh, let's dissect his, his hand because. His hand is so giving and so, you know, it blesses. And oh, when he lays his hand upon me and all, you know, all that stuff. And uh, uh, let's, you know, let's go after his mind and oh, you know, his love. And, you know, and so we start cutting Jesus up and we cut him up into little pieces. We're like, 
We're like, we're like uh, doctors in training with a cadaver, and we cut him into pieces, and we examine it, and we go, oh, you know, l yes, love patience, but we don't make it Christ. We're just trying to figure out all the parts of Jesus, and then we want to get it. Well, how about a new method? How about instead of cutting him up, how about becoming those members through whom he, he flows by nature and by attitude and by attributes? wonderful, wonderful uh, method, <laughs> if you will, of, of releasing these things in us instead of to us. And so, so Paul steps into that arena now. Let this mind be in you. He said, be of one mind. This is the mind. Let this mind be in you. And he's about to describe it. He's about to describe the mind that needs to be in you. And, he, and you say, well, he just described it over here when he says, not a, you know, esteem others better than yourself and, and uh, every man look not only on his things but the other. No, that's what he's described how it manifests. He's about to describe it as Christ. It's a difference between the manifestation of Christ and Christ. Did you know that Christ can manifest through his body through miracles and through one particular member who prays and people get healed, and yet that manifestation is not necessarily Christ formed in that person. The goal is not the manifestation of Christ. The goal is Christ in you who will manifest himself any way he wants to through you, you as a particular member. Most people are confused by that because they're seeking the manifestation. Don't seek it. Seek Christ with all your heart. Seek Christ. Let him, let him figure out how he wants to manifest through you. Put it in his hands. Trust in his heart. Trust in oneness with him. Trust that you don't have to work on yourself. You are his workmanship, created in union with Christ Jesus. That's what the scriptures say. Is that, is that a good answer? Well, it's Paul's answer. Let this mind be glorified. No. Let this mind be understood. No, that's deeper life. No, no. He's not dealing with trying to educate the body of Christ. He says, let this mind be in you. Does it get any more clear than that? And again, he's going to describe what he wants to be in you. And he's going to show that if this mind truly is in you, there won't be all this strife and vainglory. There won't be all of this stuff. You will esteem others better than yourself, but not based on a principle of esteem. You know, you can go home and get your computer and print out this thing that says esteem others better than yourself and, and hang it, you know, on the ceiling of your bed. And every night before you turn out the light, you go, Esteem others better than yourself. Click. Esteem others better than yourself. Esteem others better than You know. And you'll do that as long as it's uh, stuck up here. But when somebody does you wrong and you're not looking at the sign, you're going to esteem them as reprobates. You know. You're going to attack or you're going to, you know, do something. React for sure. So... Paul is crying out for the church. Does anybody cry out for the church? Does anybody understand the, the depth of the heart cry of a man who's seen the truth and, is, and realizes that so much has been set into play that isn't even Jesus, isn't even out from his life? Uh, uh, we, Robert and I were talking about this just a few days ago, how... You know, a, a brother came over and said, hey, let's go witnessing and everything. And for the first time in his life, he was feeling, I don't think I'm supposed to, you know. And that's a weird feeling because, what? no, my God, we're all supposed to witness, you know. And he was feeling like, you know, I don't know that the Lord in, in the life in me is saying, let's go witness now. Oh, it's really shocking if the life in you is saying, you need to just relax a little bit and you sit down and turn on a TV for a little while. And, you, and I'm not 
promoting hours upon hours of soap operas or whatever. Okay, I'm not promoting that. I'm just saying that God can move any way he wants to. And if you need to rest because you've been serving him with all your heart, soul, and strength, and my God, don't worry about, come on, bro. And you, and you don't want to say no to that guy. You wouldn't, especially you wouldn't want to explain it to him. I don't think it's the Lord. What? Well, right here it says go into all the world. Well, you're not going into all the world. You're just going into Denton. You need to get moving, buddy. <laughs> you know, I mean, if you, if you take it literally the way they're trying to make it literally, then, you know, why are you still here in Denton? Shouldn't you be in Calcutta or something, you know? Shouldn't you? Huh? You're committed. I'm not. Go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I'm not. I'm not that I would not respond with that. My point is, is simply that Christ is our life and he will manifest. And we, you know, what do we do? Television has ruined everything. Now you see all these televangelists, you know, oh, I went here and I did this and look at what I'm doing here. And, you know, send money because I'm really, you know, and we go, I'm, I'm not doing anything. Well, well, they may not be, you know, or actually they may be doing it all. And not any of it be Christ. And you've heard me tell this story before. If God told Billy Graham to go save thousands of people and spend his life doing that, and he tells you to keep the toilets in Acts Bible School spotless, and if you go against the Lord, and you go out there and you win thousands of people to the Lord, and that not be his will for your life, then you failed completely. So, but it, you know, have we not preached you in the streets? Have we not cast out demons in your name? And he goes, I don't even know you. Well, you know, you know, Jesus knows his hands and his feet and his toes and his, you know, he knows his body. But he had no independent spirits that are just trying to religiously, folks. The Mormons, the, 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 the Hindus, the, you know, everybody's, you know, the Muslims, they're all trying to proselyte, you know? They're all trying to get people to join them. Is that the Lord? You know, there are, there are companies that aren't even Christian trying to get people to join them. Uh, I'm trying to think of you know, Avon and some of the other, you know, come join me, you know, come join us and sell. You could get a pink Cadillac or something, and I don't know what all that, you know, but, you know, so you could have had a pink one, you know. <clears throat> but, <laughs> yeah, see, if you'd have sold more. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's that woman thou gavest me. <clears throat> <laughs> But that's it. I mean, it's all wrapped up, folks, in this, in this go mentality, this American mentality, this, this we've got to, you know, we've got to do it. And that's it. That's the problem. We've got to do it. We've got to make this thing happen. We've got to accomplish these things. I would rather do, you know, I'd rather do 10 things in my life and it be Christ than a million things and it all have been me by my strength and by my mind. Now, that's, that's how I feel. And, and I think that we have scriptural proof of that. You know, I've used Daniel as an example before, but Daniel was, went into captivity when he was around 15 years old, and he died in captivity around 80. And we read the stuff about Daniel, and we go, oh, what a man of God. Well, if you consider the, just read those stories and consider the length of time that they took. Some of them happen within two days. And there's only like at the most 10 of those over a period of 65 years. T 10 situations where it was the Lord. That's all God saw. That's all God noticed was the time when it was the Lord. All the other times aren't recorded. 
Well, Lord, what about the time? What about this? What about I brought my list, Lord. You've left a lot out. He's going, you should never have brought that list before man. <laughs> but that's our pride, folks. And that's our human achievement. And Paul is uh, not wanting to, to lead the church in that direction. So he starts with, here's, how, here's what needs to be done. But now here's how it's done. It's done by Christ, and it's done by union, and it's done by not you, but Christ living in you. Let this mind be in you. Well, how's that happen? Okay, now come on. Let's, let's consider just practically how, it, uh, you know, I mean, if I wanted Nicole's mind in me, how would I get it? Well, you get a really sharp saw. Okay? And you start cutting right about here, and he goes, and then you go, and then you take the brain out, and then you open your head up, and you put it in there. And, you know, the problem is we're only supposed to have his mind, but we shove it in there with ours, and then wonder why we got a headache all the time. <clears throat> That's not the method. There is no such method, there's only one method. You've got to be the same body. You've got to be a body to the head. And then every member gets the mind. Get it? See, we say, oh, Lord, oh, Holy Spirit, give me the mind of Jesus. Oh, give me the mind of Christ. I want this mind to be in me. And so we start, usually we start studying scripture so that we can change our mind. You know, whereas we used to sit in the bar and sing body songs, now we sit in church and we dance and, you know, you know. And we think that's, that's a big change. You, you just changed where you're doing it at and the subject of your singing. But the body of Christ is the vehicle of his manifestation. <clears throat> no other way. Um, consider this. Consider a man and wife. <clears throat> and he goes, okay. We, we got married yesterday. And uh, I'm the head. So you got, I'm not, I'm not talking to you. <clears throat> I'm the head. And you got to do what I say. Anybody following this? I'm the head, so you got to do what I say. <clears throat> okay. So I'm going to start. Uh, we're going to be together all our life, and I'm going to start telling you how to do it, and what I want, and da 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 da. Okay? Ah! Don't do that. Uh, yeah, that's that's good. That's good. Uh, well, I don't like this kind of food. Go do this. And if you put it on that basis, if you put it on that basis, one of two things are going to happen. You're either going to crush her spirit, or she's going to kill you. <laughs> Because you're not really, get, listen carefully, you're not really imparting your mind. You're telling her your rules. Hello. Anybody see a difference? There's a big difference. It's a huge difference, vast difference. But it is possible for a woman to just be around you and pick up on the things that you like and that, you know, I mean... Um, you know, my wife, sometimes I'll be sitting there, we'll, we'll be out somewhere or something, and I won't even have said something. And she'll give me a gift that I wasn't expecting because we were out two months earlier, and I was standing there looking at something, and she saw a little curl come up on the edge of my mouth, and I never said anything, but she goes, I know that look. He really likes that. And so, you know, I'm going to get him that dog <laughs> or whatever. <clears throat> and then there it is. Folks, 
that's being one, that's being so in tune. I mean, I, I, you know, and that doesn't describe it. How do you describe it fully? You know what I mean? How do you, but I am telling you that it is that, that a genuine oneness, the two actually become one. Okay. Um, so that's where Paul's going with this. He didn't say, let this brain be in you. He said, let this mind be in you. And then he says, which was also in Christ Jesus. There it is. There it is. Have the mind of Christ. See, I mean, first of all, I mean, we're talking about husband and wife. I don't think there's, I, this, is my, this is me. I don't think I got any right to ask her to follow me unless I'm following Christ. Because, you know, it says, Paul said, follow me while I follow Christ. I mean, that's my opinion. And I think I should follow Christ with more vim and vigor than she follows me. Because I'm the example, I'm the head, I'm the, you know, you understand what I'm saying? I mean, I think God laid out the order. The order, he said, was God and Christ and man and woman and, you know. And I think that the expectation should be here. I must be about my father's business. Do you notice Jesus never said that to anybody else? You must be about that father. Ah, oh my God, you're not. <laughs> but why? Why? Why would he never say that when, when you know how committed he was to the father's business and to the father's heart and to the things of the father? Why would he never say that? Because he figured if you became one with him, you'd be about the father's business because he is and that what he is would flow into you. It's, it's, it's not that difficult. You know, we make this thing so difficult, you know. And, and, you know, you as students can make it difficult. You can hear what I'm saying and go, well, this is so deep. It's not deep. It's one. It's just be one. You know, now how do you, how do you bridge that gap? How do you do that? Only by the revelation of Christ. You don't earn it. But, folks... There ain't no need, there is no need at all to try to live a Christian life apart from Christ because there in, the, in the vernacular of the text, and it was said, there ain't no such thing. There ain't no such thing. Because there ain't. <laughs> That's all you can say. Because it just doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist in the mind of the Father. It doesn't exist in the heart, soul, and fullness that is Christ. It does not exist to serve God apart from the body. You, you, okay. And there our minds can go. There, our minds will run off in many different directions like roaches scattering with the light turned on. But all I'm saying is Christ is one and we're one with him. And Paul knows that the problems that the Philippian church is facing, that they just simply need Jesus. And he's going, he's going for the juggler. <laughs> he's going for the real deal. And he's blessing those people better than anybody could have by keeping them focused and centered on Christ. Because it's God's way. It is God's way. All right. So, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And then he begins to describe it. Who... Okay, so he's going to tell you what you're supposed to be like. Okay, I'm, I'm trying to take this slow. He's not telling you what you're supposed to be like independently from him. He's not telling you how to shape up or what equates to shaping up. He's describing the one that you're one with, and he's hoping you'll get your eyes off yourself or off the, the brother or sister that is causing you uh, consternation you know and and hoping that if you'll see Jesus whether you know 
whether they deserve it or not, there's going to be some esteem. Esteem. Who, this is Jesus, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now, if, if you have marginal notes, and some do and some don't, but my Bible has thought it not robbery. The word robbery has a little A beside it, and in the margin it says literally a thing to be held on to or grasped after is really what it says. Anybody have that in a margin? That's what it's describing. That's what it's describing. Okay? But. Remember, anytime you see the word but, it, it has changed the direction. Like you're going this way, and would mean, and we're continuing on this journey. It's a conjunction. You're, you're, you're joining up with the word and. But the word but is telling you, red flag, there's, there's something in another direction here. He thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now, probably next class, I'll read some stuff that will help us comprehend the depth of what Jesus did and therefore uh, the implications of what oneness means to us. Thought it not a thing to be held on to, thought it not a thing to be grasped after, but here in verse 7 it says, but made himself of no reputation. And if some of you have a marginal note there beside that, anybody? but made himself of no reputation. Jim, what does yours say? He emptied himself. He divested himself of, the, of his visible glory. All right. This little phrase right here is, is the heart of the matter that we're primarily going to be focusing on. The word... Uh, made himself of no reputation is those, those translators, or the King James guys, is the King James boys, King James gang. <laughs> it's their, their way of trying to express the reality of this, but the original Greek is it's almost like coming from two different angles. And when you bring those two together, it helps to express what they're trying to say. So there is this thing of making yourself of no reputation. But the literal Greek doesn't even use the word reputation. In fact, it is talking about he emptied himself. That's literally what it's saying. He emptied himself. And if you look up the word in, in the Greek, it's this word from kenosis, where we get the word kenosis. Okay? It's the kenosis of Christ, the self emptying. Now, because that's a Greek word, and because it brings about an idea, that can be studied theologically. You can study the kenosis of Christ theologically and never change, and never realize that this is being brought up because there's problems between people in the church, or if you will, problems between members of the body of Christ, and Paul is trying to get them back on the right keel, and the right keel is Christ. Okay, so, but, but you can take this, and there are theologians, and if you are, if you are, you know, if, if you have a bent in that direction, you can go get big, thick books that, that teach about the kenosis of Christ, or you can buy a systematic theology book. Oh, baby. Anybody, any, how many of you here own a systematic theology book? Figures. <laughs> the two Pharisees in the crowd. Just kidding. Um, I remember 
when I was in Bible school, my teacher, when I, I had to take systematic theology, and in that class, the teacher said, you are required to get a systematic theology book. And he said, to keep us all on the same page, I want you to get, you know, Doctor of Divinity, so-and-so, so-and-so's book. Okay, so I got it. The book was that thick. It was like, you know, it was, a, it was like this, but that thick. And the words, the letters were teeny tiny. I mean, but you know what? I wanted to know Jesus, and I wanted, you know, so I, 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 I'm sure I still got that book somewhere. And I got in that book, and it hurt my brain. I didn't get the mind of Christ out of it. I got a, I, I got a wounded brain. You know, my noggin has never been the same. But my, I mean, it's like, oh, you know, well, this person says this. You know, but this person says that. In other words, there's nothing systematic about it. Everybody's coming saying all this other stuff. And they've got whole sections on the kenosis of Christ and what it means. Not that it'll change the church. Not that it'll remove pride or, or vainglory or strife. Just simply study this stuff, man. This is deep. And then that you can spout, well, the... The Greek there really is kenosis. It's not really made himself of no reputation. He emptied himself, and what that means is, and after a while you can't even hear what they're saying. It's like droning on and on and on. Well, interestingly enough, years and years and years later, I ran across Charles Finney's Systematic Theology. It's a thick, thick book. Little words, just like all systematic theology, but at least it had something to say. You know, at least it had something to say. And it primarily dealt with your motives. Not your actions, but what motivated you to do that. Remember we talked about uh, malice on Sunday? I talked about malice and wickedness. And malice is the desire to see someone hurt, something like that, to su see them suffer. Well, that's only a desire, but wickedness is carrying that desire out and in some form and manner, some device to make sure that it comes to pass. Well, let me tell you, when you start manifesting stuff, you can really get in trouble with God. It's one thing to be ugly on the inside. <laughs> no, no, I'm serious. I am serious. It's one thing to be ugly on the inside. It's another thing to start unleashing that in manifest ways through devices devised to hurt and cause suffering and damage. When I see people doing that, I don't care if it's toward me or anybody else, I always think, oh, Lord, help them. Help them because they're about to really get into some ugly, ugly stuff. All right, so he, he made himself of no reputation or he emptied himself. And it looks like we're rolling around. Yes. Very good. And I'm going to get into that. He emptied himself of his privileges. That's the wife. But the husband said he divested himself of his visible glory. That's what Jim said. Or which one's right? Are they one? Will this be the end of their long marriage? Stay tuned for next class because you are now dismissed and we'll come back in the next one. <laughs>